again, we have to think clearly in our day. Utah governor signs a bill making reparative therapy illegal. California did it. New York's done it. New Jersey, I think, starts on the coast and moves inward. And we recognize that there is a grave danger here. And the grave danger is if what you're saying is no one can offer help to someone who wants to change their sexual orientation, then not only are you putting in law that sexual orientation is immutable, even though sexual orientation is whatever you think it is for any given day, so it can't be immutable. But anyway, um, I saw an article today about how the T's are trying to get rid of all the L's and G's and B's. And it's true. There is a... And and I, I'm, for one, going to sit back and go, you all have fun on that one. Um, because the T is particularly pernicious along those lines. Um, but anyway, um, if we put into law that sexual orientation is not something that can be touched, then we're concerned that that's going to impact my preaching 1 Corinthians chapter 6 or 1 Timothy chapter 1 or Romans 1 or anything else. Um, so here's, here's where once again, what we've gotten into is we've, we've seen a danger and then we end up being pushed into defending something we're not consistently capable of defending. You can, on the one hand, say, look, the government shouldn't be involved in any of this stuff. And if somebody wants to seek help, religiously or non-religiously, then they should be free to do so, and all this is a bunch of totalitarian nonsense. Okay, that's one thing. But from a Christian perspective, if we say that we are afraid of the banning of reparative therapy, does it mean that that means reparative therapy is a Christian concept? Think about it. Think about it. Rosari Butterfield states, quote, I do not believe sexual orientation changes are a gospel imperative. I'm on record for saying reparative therapy, therapy is the prosperity gospel. Reparative therapy is a heresy. On this earth, God will give one person ten crosses to bear and another person one. End quote. What's she talking about? Last year, sometime, maybe the year before, there was a bunch of discussion about therapeutic, moralistic deism. Remember that? How there's self-help methodologies out there. That's, that's not what the gospel is. The gospel is not a self-help methodology. And the Christian understanding of salvation and regeneration is that Human psychology, there might be people who find in human psychology, um, you know, if they, if they don't want the attractions that they've experienced, I could see a situation where in some instances that might be helpful to them in some sense, maybe some discipline in their lives or identifying something in their past, whatever. But from a Christian perspective, reparative therapy is not conversion. And you can't change a heart outside of conversion. So we have no business defending secular, psychiatric, psychological reparative therapy any more than we would any other kind of psychological paradigm that does not deal with the heart, that does not deal with the need for regeneration. But once again, what happens is we see the danger in banning that in connection to our own proclamation, and therefore we defend that rather than our own proclamation and think that that makes it somehow a good thing. And what Rosaria is saying is, that's the prosperity gospel. That's, that's saying that God has promised that you're going to be healthy, wealthy, and wise as soon as you get converted. 
So, when the Gospels turned into reparative therapy, the idea is, get saved and all your problems are going to go away. You're not going to have any desires for whatever your problems are any longer. Just come to Jesus and everything's going to be good. And this leads us to then probably the most important part of the discussion. And that is, we know of people, the media doesn't want to talk about them, but there are people who can testify and then have 20 years of Christian experience afterwards that also testifies to the fact that upon repentance and faith, a fundamental change in desires took place in their lives. So there have been people who have been saved and never touched drugs, whatever their drug of choice had been, heroin, methamphetamines, speed, whatever. Never touched it again. Complete change. There are others who were sexually addicted and they're wonderfully delivered. There are others who could not keep their hands off of other people's property. They would steal all the time. And they haven't touched anything since their conversion. We know that that happens. We know that can happen. And that's a wonderful thing. But we live in a fallen world. And outside of sinless perfectionists, the few of them that there be... <laughs> most self-deceived people ever to walk the planet. Um, outside of sinless perfectionists, the experience of any minister in the church in dealing with souls is that we need an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Because we still experience sin. And hence, we know people who are fully delivered, and then people who are not. What do you do, do with a person who is not? What do you do with a person who comes to you very honestly and they say, I want to follow Jesus. I want to honor Jesus. I do not want the feelings and desires that I have. And in my upbringing, I, I knew nothing, nothing whatsoever about addiction. I didn't know anyone, at least knowingly know. I may have, in my ignorance, have known some addicts. Let me just tell you a story. I'm, I'm not saying this to embarrass him, but just as an illustration of um, this point. But... I ate at Cafe Rio today. I love Cafe Rio. I love their chicken quesadillas. They're just wonderful. And for some reason, ever since last year when I joined Apologia, and then when I became an elder, that's seemingly the only place that we meet together. <laughs> it's, the other guys think that's the only place I ever eat at all. And you know it's not because I've eaten at Taco Time. So... The look I just got is worse than anything he's ever done about a Kuji. <laughs> anyway, um, so, you know, I like other places. I like Olive Garden and places like that. But anyway, we, 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 re, we eat at Cafe Rio. A number of months ago, um, we're getting there. We get there at different times. And a couple of us walked in. I think it was Zach and I had walked in. And all of a sudden, Jeff peeled off. I don't think Luke was there yet. Jeff peeled off. And outside, there's a place you can sit with some misters, you know? Even in, even in Phoenix, July, August, nobody sits out there. You can't. But 
there was this guy sitting out there. And I saw Jeff sort of peel off and, and go talk to the guy. And I, so Zach and I ordered and we sat down and I see Jeff going through the line and, and then he drops his food off the table, but then he takes more food that he got out to the guy on the, on the patio. And I'm sort of watching this going, well, is he just seeing a homeless person and, you know, doing some benevolence or, or what's, what's going on here? Well, finally, when he comes in, he sits down and he just goes, heroin, mainline it. And I'm like, what? He says, yeah, I saw that guy out there. I could tell it was on heroin. And so I uh, went up to him and said, are you, are you shooting or smoking? Just straight up. You shoot, shooting it or smoking it? I'm shooting it. So you know it's going to kill you. Yeah. And he says he, you know, God can free you from this. You have to turn from your sin. Jesus is a powerful Savior. He came in, bought his food, and bought the other guy food, and took it out to him, and just, just told him, you know, if you want help, we can help you, but you're going to kill yourself. You're, you're, you don't have long, I can tell. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. So, I didn't see that, but Jeff did, because Jeff has worked with addicts forever. And from 40 feet away, could tell what drug he was doing and where he was in the progression of his addiction. I did not grow up with that. That's outside of my experience zone by a long, 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 long shot. And so the question then becomes, what would have happened if that guy had said, dude, I want help right now. Can you help me right now? Well, I know what Jeff would have done. And we wouldn't have had a meeting that day. We would have been taking this guy and getting him the help that he needed and then staying in contact with him and visiting him and getting him involved with the church and everything else. That's, that's how we do things. Um, there would have been follow-up. There would have been application. There would have been... But what if... Let's say he got off heroin, and let's say he's baptized, and we find him a job, and six months later, he calls us up and says, guys, I, I almost did it today. I almost fell off the wagon, man. I, I saw somebody I used to know, and I, I know that they, they deal, and I just, I just wanted it so bad. What do you do with that person? What do you do? Do you say, well, must not take him. Well, beyond Jesus' help. You, you want to believe that all those desires will be done away with. But they aren't, aren't always done away with. So what do you do? Well, I know, I, I, I mean, I could ask Jeff to talk about this. And I think, hasn't he, did he ever do it? He did a program on this once, didn't he? When I was gone. Um, they focus upon the idolatry that is the root foundation of addiction. Idolatry. I'm sorry, what? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Um, talks about idolatry. There would have been personal responsibility. Uh, it's the first church I've ever been at that has a supply of um, breathalyzers um, has the ability to if someone wants that kind of accountability to establish that kind of accountability in regards to drug usage the whole nine yards because that's what, that's what the church grew out of so in other words we have a lot of experience not me, I'm only learning but the church has a lot of experience in dealing with people who come out of that lifestyle and yet continue to struggle in this life. Now, the options are um, they're not saved in the first place. So there's, there are some who would say 
that if a person professes faith in Christ but still has a desire for alcohol, all the various forms of drugs, so on and so forth, just not a Christian, that every single person will be delivered completely from those desires. Is it just those desires? Is it just the desires that had wreaked havoc in your life? Or is it all sinful desires? Because I think most Orthodox Christians recognize we continue to experience sinful desires. So we have to be real careful here where we're going to draw the line. And it seems that for some people, well, you draw the line at sexual sins and drug abuse. And it's like, why those? Because they're so much different than my experience. And even when you say sexual sins, you don't, you don't mean, you don't mean porn and you don't mean, um, any of the related heterosexual manifestations of lust. You only mean that other stuff, the really, really bad stuff. Cause if it's part of my desires, then it's not the really, really bad stuff. It's the normal bad stuff, but not really, really bad stuff. Theologically, I don't think that's an option. So what do we do? How do we handle this? Most churches have never given it a second thought. And I've been talking about addiction. Okay, let's put that off to the side. We know what we're really talking about. Is there a promise in the gospel that every person who is saved will be delivered from same-sex attraction? I suppose we could deal with the issue of transgenderism, too. That's even more complicated. I almost didn't get to talk about this in a certain country I was in this year. Because I expressed to my hosts my belief that I believe it is acceptable and normative to express, to expect, I'm sorry, to expect a process of sanctification in the life of a true believer that would, over time, lead to the establishment of godly parameters of life. On almost any level of a discussion of sin, I think that's going to be accepted as a as an orthodox statement. What then does that mean in regards to a person who experiences same-sex attraction? What I'm saying is I think it is normative. I'm using that term purposefully to expect over time a growth in holiness that would indicate a commensurate decrease in desires that are directly against the heart of God. As I grow in my love for God, I decrease in my love for the things of the world. Whatever, whatever your addiction or attraction or desire might be, as I grow in holiness, that moves me farther away from unholiness, ungodliness. Does that process move at the same speed for everyone? No. That's not my experience in ministry. I don't think it's anybody else's experience in ministry that it, we can all just track it. Oh, he's at, he's at month three. He's at month six. No. Is it a progress that is over time and can experience ups and downs? Yeah. What do you do with the person who 10 years in still says, I'm still struggling with this? I would want to know, I would especially want to know, 
what kind of true progress is being made in a growing love for God's truth? And does the person possess knowledge of what it is God calls, for example, a man to be? Or a woman to be? Um, and in light of that growing understanding of the goodness of those things, has that resulted in a diminishment of a desire for that which you know is disordered? You know is disordered. So when Rosaria and others say that the solution to homosexuality is not heterosexuality. I hope she's not saying that there is not a fundamental difference between the two, that one is God's creative desire for mankind and the other is against that. She admits that in her books, that there is a difference between the two. But what I assume she is saying is what we were talking about before, and that is if you're just dealing with the surface level stuff, the top level sins, and chopping the top of the dandelions off, by switching from homosexuality to heterosexuality, boom, well, now you have a prideful heterosexual rather than a prideful homosexual. You haven't gotten to the root matter. And so the solution for homosexuality isn't heterosexuality. The solution for homosexuality is realizing it's rooted in idolatry and pride, you change the heart, idolatry, and pride, and then you instruct the person, this is what would be pleasing in God's sight. And this is why, this is his creative order, and therefore, this is the path that you should walk. And I think it's perfectly fair to say that normatively, over time, there should be a growth in that grace. But I'm not prepared to say what the time frame has to be. And I'm not prepared to say that it's not God's intention to have certain people struggle with the same things their entire life, because I happen to know far too many aged Christians who will profess to you that they thought that passing 70 was going to mean that things were going to get really easy then, and in point of fact, that wasn't the case at all. Certainly some temptations are not nearly as much for the 70-year-old as for the 20-year-old. No question about that. But the reality is an aged saint is even more sensitive to certain aspects of their sin than the younger saint is. And so the battle never ends. The battle never ends. So I think there is a, ne a necessity... To stand firm on homosexuality is a disordered desire. It is against the created ordinance of God. It brings death. It is not to be seen alone, but as Paul presents it in Romans 1, it is the fruit of a more basic twisting of the creator-creation relationship. On the part of man, it's pride. Negatively, on the part of man, it's idolatry. It is setting yourself up as an authority apart from and in opposition to God. And therefore, that regeneration is to, we, we, we pray and hope for a complete removal of any desires that would cause stumbling in that person's life. That's not normally what happens, and so the normative experience is a process of sanctification, application of God's truth over time, and growth in holiness that should result in the diminishment of the power of those desires and a growth in the opposite desires for godliness that would counterbalance those things. Um, you have the microphone up. Am I unfairly hearing a little bit of an element here as they discuss the issue of going from homosexuality to heterosexuality and there being a... a, a a conclusion to that or some kind of conversion in there that I'm sensing a legalistic approach to this? As, a, as In other words, not that I'm saying that 
it's better for culturally that we have a, homose- a heterosexual society and that we're not bringing God's judgment down upon us through rampant homosexuality like you would have in, for instance, Sodom and Gomorrah. But the solution to this is conversion and change. For one to simply switch from being homosexual to heterosexual is still just as dead in sin. Well, the, well, the context here is all—the the context, I hope here, at least at this point, is all in reference to um, Christian conversion. So we're not talking about right. for society right. or any of that. The issue is when a person is converted and they become a member of the church, what is the appropriate expectation that we should have in regards to that person's attitude towards sinful actions that they were accustomed to or attracted to in the pre-conversion situation. Right, but I'm still, I'm just hearing a little bit of that moral reformation appeal, and that doesn't change... Well, right, I, I, yeah, the person I wouldn't call that legalism in the sense, I mean, moral reformation, yeah, uh, therapeutic self-help help deism, that type of thing, no. What I think, I'm, I'm going with the best scenario here. The best scenario is that the discussion is, are you actually saying that God cannot change a person? And I don't believe that either myself or Rosario are saying that. Um, I think that what some people will say is, God promises always, because 1 Corinthians 6, 9 says, such were some of right, you. Right, right. Does that mean that, and looking at that text, and, and we're, let, me, let me do this to finish up the, um, finish up the program. Uh, okay. And we can go over here. Um, so, would we be right to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6 in, in the following fashion? Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, using the ESV rendering, this says effeminate, nor homosexuals, but it's the, it's the malakoi, darasinakoitai, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Such were some of you. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and the Spirit of our God. So, you have the assertion, such were some of you. So let's, let's leave the homosexual issue off to the side for just a moment. Let's use covetous. Covetous. Um, before your conversion you have a constant unhappiness and desire for the possessions of others. No, no contentment. God has cheated me. Look at what, look at that car that other guy has. I had some guy in a, I think a Camaro coming down Bethany home today. And it's the Camaro that has the blue and orange LEDs in the headlight. So during the day, it looks like it's looking at you and it wants to eat you. He was trying to run me off the road, so it sort of did feel that way, too. Um, But you might be the kind of person who goes, why does that guy have that? I need that. I want that. God owes that to me. Covetousness. So, according to 1 Corinthians 6, 11, you once were covetous. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of Lord Jesus Christ, the Spirit of our God. Does that mean sinless perfectionism? Does, does that mean we will not experience coveting in our lives as believers? Thieving, thievery, drunkenness, um, revilers. Revilers, that's an interesting, interesting term. Um, Are we to take 
a passage like this. And some people would say there really isn't that much of a difference between the pre-conversion and post-conversion person. I'm not saying that. The question is, in light of the continuing presence of abiding sin, in light of putting to death the deeds of the flesh, if there weren't still deeds of the flesh to be dealing with, there would be no need to mortif for mortification, putting them to death. All these things are no longer to define us. They are not our identity. And therefore, and Rosaria has said this, there's no such thing as a gay Christian. And so the revoice people, the idea of this is a gift from God, uh, all the rest of that kind of stuff, no. It is something to be rejected, that I will define myself in this fashion. No, no, and more no. But what if in your deepest, honest situation, you recognize you're con you continue to deal with these desires? Then you mortify the flesh, you go to the body, you seek the body's assistance in holding you accountable. And what I think Rosaria is trying to say, and some others are trying to say, is that if we're going to do that, then there has to be the provision of some mechanism, because people just can't do this alone. In our families, we have mechanisms to help us in that way. But if you are a homosexual, you don't have a family to do that with, at least in the church. Necessarily, I mean, I suppose if your family's in the church, but that's an unusual situation. Um, and so how does that flesh itself out? How do you... Her insistence is hospitality, being around other Christians, being held accountable, being encouraged. That's how she was brought to her position. The real problem is that this is a subject that requires a tremendous amount of sensitivity from the elders of a church and the ministers of a church, and hence is particularly liable to be used inappropriately to take a extreme position and then use it as a weapon against others, rather than going, yeah, you know what, this is a really tough situation and it's it's something that has not been discussed nearly as much as it should be, and we live in a day of great compromise, where Scripture isn't seen as being sufficient to answer these questions any longer, all the rest of that kind of stuff. It certainly should not be a subject that is used to vilify someone else when all of us have a great deal of thought to be putting into exactly how pastorally to make application of these things. 